The U.S. Congress remained dangerously split on Wednesday over raising the federal cap on borrowing. So far, all efforts at compromise among the Republican-controlled House, the Democratic-run Senate, and President Barack Obama have right, failed. Right, thank you. Thank you. The U.S. has less than a week to reach a deal to increase its $14.3 trillion debt limit or face not being able to pay its bills. That has led to fears the country could default on its financial obligations, posing a threat to the global economy as a whole. The debt drama in the U.S. has continued to affect Asia. Asia-Pacific currencies have already been rising, as traders anticipate more action by policymakers to keep inflation at bay. HBC's Gary Evans also expects capital inflows to return to the region, as investors take refuge from debt crises in the U.S. and Europe. In the next 6 to 12 months, the concerns are going to shift rather more towards growth. People will worry about whether growth in the developed world is going to continue, um, and they'll worry about global cyclical growth. And if you look at some of the markets like a China, but also India and Brazil, I think people will start to say, well, you know, growth is fine, inflation is no longer a risk. It's actually as a risk and reward balance. China and these other markets start to look more interesting. Asian stocks traded mixed Wednesday as investors continue to hedge by buying gold. But recent risk-related sell-offs have been measured, with many investors aware of the political nature of the U.S. crisis. Standard Charter's Stephen Green adds large international investors, including Beijing, may have few alternatives to the U.S. Treasury market. FX reserves are still rising. They're rising at about 30 to $40 billion a month. Uh, what do you do with that cash? Um, you can't really, I mean, there are two places to park that amount of, of cash, and it's in the euro and U U.S. debt markets. So that's one consideration. The other consideration is that if, if China started to sell its treasuries and the, the fallout on the value of the dollar and in the U.S. debt markets would be huge. Uh, and so China knows it cannot really sell uh, its U.S. holdings. Though most investors think a last-minute deal to raise the debt limit will eventually emerge, the difficulty of reaching an agreement may leave a lasting impact on investor sentiment. Even if a deal is reached, there are fears the U.S. could still lose its top credit rating. Welcome back to the studio discussion here. Dr. Aziz, uh, are you optimistic that there will be a breakthrough in the current nail-biting negotiations between Republicans and Democrats over how to and when to uh, raise the federal uh, debt ceiling? Well, it depends on what kind of final outcome that we are expecting. If the expectation is simply the resolutions of the debt ceiling, I'm pretty optimistic. And also, if the question is really whether the U.S. is going to default or not, I don't think it's going to happen. But it's still important to discuss what if that scenario happened, and especially how it impacts the Asian economy. President Barack Obama accused the Republicans of uh, not doing homework uh, ahead of the uh, uh, deadline. And, uh, but uh, Professor Yao Yang, mm -hmm. are you confident that uh, the U.S., uh, the two parties will not default on their obligations uh, uh, to the uh, overseas uh, bondholders? Well, I'm uh, uh, quite op optimistic on that front, uh, precisely because uh, the consequences uh, are going to be too bad, uh, not just uh, for the rest of the world, but uh, for the United States itself. So I think uh, some kind of agreement uh, is going to be reached uh, by August uh, 2nd but probably not uh, in President Obama's term. That is, it's going to be a very short uh, agreement, maybe extending to just the end of this year. And uh, this is going to be a hostage that the Republicans uh, are going to use uh, frequently against uh, President Obama before the election. I'm afraid the two sides, Republicans and Democrats, are held hostage by two issues in dispute. The one is that the Republicans demand the the Obama administration that uh, government spending be cut uh, greatly and in return President Obama asked the Republicans uh, to tax the super rich and the rich that the Democrat, I mean the Republicans represent uh, uh, in their constituencies. What do you think of the deadlock? Well the simple matter of the fact is that you cannot really sort of improve your budget position by uh, cutting expenditure if you don't raise the taxes. So basically both sides have the point here. 
and I'm pretty optimistic that uh, in one way or another they will resolve these issues. Maybe it will be very different in terms of the final figures from the Republicans' point of view as well as from the Democratic point of view. But I'm quite optimistic there will be a sort of resolution even on the budget side because we have to distinguish these two different issues. One is on the debt ceiling issue and the second is on the fiscal side. Professor Yao Yang, why do you think the Chinese authorities are so concerned about the future and safety of the Chinese mm. Treasury securities? Uh, because we are the largest uh, overseas uh, holder of the U.S. Uh, Treasury securities. Well, al although the probability of a default is uh, actually very small, but uh, the world is going to be thrown into uh, deep uncertainty in the next uh, 18 years, be 18 months before the election. So, you know, the market is going to react uh, in a very volatile manner, and uh, China has every reason to worry. Um, Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton assured uh, uh, participants uh, of a seminar in Hong Kong, uh, most of which, uh, most of the participants came from the American Chamber of Commerce in this territory, mm -hmm. that the U.S. Uh, will live up to its commitments mm -hmm. and, uh, and pay the bills mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. um, he, she also warned, uh, I believe she must be talking to the domestic audiences in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, that the American consumers uh, have to uh, borrow less and save more mm -hmm. and what does that mean for the uh, healthy economy I I if possible uh, of the US recovery? Yeah, uh, this is very unfortunate uh, event because the 2008 global financial crisis that hit the US economy very hard uh, create this kind of what I personally call uh, doing the right thing at the wrong time because the US economy, we have to remember, seven, more than 70% of the US economy comes from consumption. So, you know, it doesn't require a rocket scientist to think about what kind of uh, things that needs to be done to sort of recover the US economy. That means consumption. But at the same time, for many, many years, US uh, savers are not saving. Basically, they are over consumption. So now they are all asked to save rather than consume. And that will not help the recovery, the short recovery of the US economy. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is I predict the US recovery will take a long time to take place. Well, I tend to agree with Dr. Aziz. Uh, in the short run, actually asking Americans to save more is a, actually a bad idea. Americans need to spend in order to go on the road of recovery, especially think about uh, the more than 9% unemployment uh, rate in the United States. Actually, the government needs to spend much more to generate the real growth uh, of jobs. And uh, currently, the Republicans uh, are doing a really, really bad job to uh, forbid the Americans uh, to get uh, uh, more jobs. I think that's uh, the real issue over there. You are right, perhaps uh, due to the robust domestic spending, China uh, is a, China's uh, foreign exchange reserves. Uh, are able to enjoy a faster than expected 30% increase uh, uh, in the first half of this year. What does that mean? Um, why has China failed to diversify its overseas uh, holdings? Well, I think uh, this is basically the, uh, how the economy, is, or the economies uh, are going on in the world. Right? China has a very strong labor force, and uh, China has a very strong manufacturing base. And of course, China exports more. I, I think this is a win-win situation, not like uh, uh, Hillary Clinton said, you know, it's uh, just a benefit in China. It's uh, bad for the United States. I don't think so. It's uh, beneficial to both countries. Dr. Aziz, uh, what should China do to stave off a possible crisis uh, about the safety of the Chinese assets in the U.S.? Well, uh, as I mentioned uh, in uh, several of my talk today in Beijing in delivering the ADB report with this Asian Economic Monitor, I think in general government and policymakers in the East Asian uh, economies have been doing quite well and I hope they are continuing to do the same. And the same thing with the Chinese official, because if 
we look at the Chinese economy, even taking into account the pressure from the inflation, I think the Chinese official have been doing very well so far. So I hope they continue to do the same. Now, what, what do I mean by doing very well? This government are not using one or two policies. They're using a mix of policies, and that's the right things to do. The reason is because this time the sources of inflation is not only coming from the demand side, but also coming from the supply side, like food prices, commodity prices, energy prices. And, and what so about the possibility of uh, having a third round of a quantitative easing fiscal policy from the Federal Reserve? Well, that depends on what happened in either August 2 or August 10, because the date of the deadline is not clear here. Uh, that depends if, for example, uh, there is no clear and favorable resolution uh, in Washington, then uh, the Federal Reserve have to do everything they can to sort of avoid from further deeper recession. And if that is the case, then quantitative easing three is possible. But as we discussed earlier, uh, I personally think that the probability for that is happening is rather low, which means quantitative easing three may not be necessary. Authorities in the Eurozone have been struggling to walk out of the shadow of the sovereign debt crisis, and yet China has been advised to diversify uh, its uh, overseas uh, securities, uh, uh, treasury securities, uh, by diverting some of them uh, from uh, the U.S. Uh, to the Eurozone uh, mm -hmm. through purchasing uh, the Euros as well as the Japanese Yen. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think of the dilemma? Because we do not trust the Europeans uh, very much. Well, I think it's uh, not uh, a matter of a choice. It's actually a fact uh, because uh, more than 60% of China's trade uh, internationally is denominated in U.S. dollars. Uh, even much of China's trade uh, with uh, European countries uh, is denominated in dollars. Uh, so in that case, uh, there are almost uh, no choice uh, for, for China. Right? You mean we have to buy more right, of we, the we U.S.? Have uh, we have so much dollar in hands. If uh, we buy uh, European assets, uh, we are going to boost uh, the value of the euro, and we are going to lose. So <laughs> there is uh, almost uh, no choice on the China side. Let us come back to examine the, the source of the inflationary pressure that we are facing mm -hmm. at this moment. Uh, a lot of the overseas economists suggest and in fact uh, strongly encourage the Chinese monetary authorities to uh, uh, reduce our external surpluses uh, so that uh, we can tame the inflation. Do they make any sense? Well, uh, everything depends on how much you do that. Uh, I think what they imply is that if you allow the yuan or renminbi to appreciate more, that will help uh, reduce the pressure on the inflation rate because you know, some of the inflation, not all, but some of the sources of inflation is imported inflation. So if you allow the currency to appreciate further, that will help reduce the inflationary pressure. But as I said earlier, this time, the source of inflation is not only coming from the demand side. So one has to also deal with the sources that come from the supply side. And this, this is the reason why almost all policymakers in the region has been doing multiple policy tools, policy instruments, not just monetary policy, not just fiscal policy, but all kinds of policies. Well, I have a little bit of different opinions on that. I think uh, most of China's uh, inflation is caused uh, by the so-called imported uh, inflation. Similar to the demand side, if uh, we don't have so much money, I don't think that the, 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 the supply side will become a problem. Uh, I also believe that uh, uh, QE3 is uh, very, very likely, regardless uh, whether there will be agreement uh, between the Congress and the White House, because uh, you know the United States actually does not have a kind of a runs out of a means uh, to generate employment. And the Fed has to do something. And QE3 is the only way for the Fed uh, to do. And in fact, President Obama is facing the embarrassing task of how to reduce the unemployment rate, which currently stands at 9%. Japan, uh, which uh, comes across as an immediate second, uh, trailing behind China as the uh, second largest uh, uh, um, holder of the American Treasury bills. Um, do you think the Japanese are worried that the U.S. might default? Uh, worry if the U.S. might default? Of course they're worried, but I think most of the policymakers in Tokyo also believe or at least confident that it's not going to happen.
it's not going to happen. But what about the possibility of buying Japanese yen as an alternative to the U.S. T-bills? Well, as I said, first of all, whoa, uh, we have a lot of dollars, uh, so it's very difficult to actually to convert to another currency. And also, I think if China buys more Japanese treasury bonds, uh, uh, Japanese are going to become quite nervous. What about India, which is yet another major emerging market? The same thing. I think most of these countries, especially those who have a huge amount of foreign reserves, and considerable amount of it are in U.S. dollar, they're worried, of course, if the value of their foreign reserves declining. But one has to remember that the impact of the worst scenario happening from Washington is not only in the portfolio, not only in terms of the value of their foreign reserve. The impact can be more devastating, and that is working through the trade channel. And at least there are two things that I can think of. Number one is, if the U.S. dollar depreciate further with I personally think it's going to happen, then it will strengthen the currency of many of the exporting countries in East Asia. And that is a bad news for the export from the East Asia, especially for the export-oriented countries. The second channel is through the, what I call the quantitative effect. Because if, what is the meaning of this uh, deadlock? Well, the deadlock means the cost of borrowing will be higher in the US. And that easily translates into the real sector. That means investment and consumption will decline in the U.S. What does it mean for Asia? That means the demand for export from Asia will also decline. So you got these two negative effects of what's happening if there is a deadlock there, and that results in the fall of the U.S. dollar. So in other words, the falling of the U.S. dollar is not only affecting the portfolio composition, uh, in terms of the dollar values declining, but also it affects the export. I am personally more worried about the export effect because many of the emerging East Asian countries, whether we like it or not, depends on export. So um, much of the exports from the emerging markets in Asia depend on the demand from European Union and other OECD countries to say nothing of the U.S. What do you think of the prospects of a quick recovery for our neighboring economies in Asia? Oh, well, uh, the world is integrated. Uh, right? uh, currently, the biggest uh, consumption market, believe it or not, it's uh, still in North America and uh, Europe. Uh, and the manufacturing center is in East Asia and uh, the surrounding countries, the economies uh, are sending a lot of raw materials uh, and the intermediate goods to China. Then China assemble them and then export it to US and the uh, EU. So that's kind of uh, the new division of labor. I don't think uh, that's going to change very quickly in the near future. So uh, if uh, the US falls, then I think uh, Asia will also fall. Now, with the rise of uh, labor costs in China, do you think uh, much of the labor-intensive manufacturing uh, factories uh, are likely to be removed from China to other low-income economies, uh, such as uh, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, Laos, Vietnam, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. uh, India, uh, in other parts of Asia? And no. what about the capabilities in those countries uh, to fight inflation and not, not very easily for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, if you look at uh, the wage data, which is uh, still very low in China compared with uh, other uh, countries, uh, uh, even uh, in Asia, in East Asia, you know, our uh, wage rates are still very, very low. So that's one thing. Uh, the second uh, thing is that uh, you have to think about, uh, you know, China exports so much, even say 1% uh, is diverted uh, to another country. That will be easily it's kind of 20 percent, 30 percent growth of that country. That's going to be impossible. So I don't think uh, you know, manufacturing is going to leave China very soon in the near future. Let's look at the uh, interest rate policy. Uh, first of all, in China, do you think uh, by raising the interest rate uh, again and again? Uh, we stand a good chance to tame inflation? The general answer is yes, but as I said earlier, uh, Chinese officials are not only using the interest rate, they're using all other means, other policy instruments. So if the question is, 
whether China can tame the inflation by doing only in, in, uh, interest rate, then the answer is no. But as I said earlier, the fact that many of the policymakers in the region, including China, are doing multiple policy instruments, I think that's the right thing to do. And eventually it will. Because keep in mind that the inflation rate, even though it's now high, it's still lower than what happened in 2008. That's number one. Number two, interest rates are very sensitive to small and medium scale industries. So policymakers have to weigh in, uh, you know, on the one hand, how to reduce the inflation, on the other hand, to help the millions of the small and medium sized uh, enterprises. So that is a really difficult kind of a policy choice not to mention the supply side of the inflation, which theoretically cannot be overcome by the monetary policy. It and has to be with other policies. And what about the confidence of Japanese consumers? Uh, and in fact, uh, most Asian stocks uh, fell amid concerns that the U.S. lawmakers will fail to reach a deal on the country's uh, debt limit. Uh, Japan, which was, a hard so, which was hit so hard by the devastating earthquake and the tsunami on March mm -hmm. the 11th this year. What do you think of the shape of the Japanese economy and their capability to, uh, uh, to stave off uh, um, mm. you know, uh, the threat of inflation? Well, well you know, uh, China cannot rely on Japan to increase uh, export because uh, Japan has a very aging population. So economic growth in the last 20 years has been less than 1% in Japan. So really, you know, Japan is going to grow with a very slow rate anyway. Uh, I think uh, in terms of inflation in China, the next uh, half of the year will be much better because uh, you know, if you look at the, the figures uh, for June, 30% uh, of the inflation rate actually was caused by a single product, uh, pork. And I believe in the fall we are going to see more pork uh, in the market. Uh, and in that case, uh, I think prices uh, will be at least uh, stabilized. Among a few other uh, robust economies, South Korea uh, proves to be a very successful story because uh, it, it, it soon uh, uh, broke free from the, the, the so-called middle income trap. What do you think of the uh, capability of the ROK to fight inflation? I think they will be doing it successfully. Uh, again, uh, because they are using not just one or two single uh, sort of uh, policy instrument because they are using several. Now, in the case of Korea, it's very interesting. If they are going to be very successful, this is going to be the second round of success of their economy. Because remember, in the 60s and the 70s, Korea is among uh, one of the East Asian miracles that was successfully transformed their economy, their structural economy from, you know, uh, like any other developing countries, agriculture base moving toward manufacturing base, through education, through you know, changing of the uh, labor force compositions by sector. And this is the reason why, uh, despite the fact there are so many discussions about inflation with spiral, I don't believe that that is going to happen in uh, Asian economies, including China. With that, we come to the end of this edition of Dialogue. We've been discussing the Asian economies amid the global debt crisis. Until next time, I'm Yang Rei. Goodbye.